And then this, this does run in real time. Uh, this is how the flocking simulation ended up looking after I added in that third rule for alignment. And uh, the source code for this project is available if you go to the uh, Cinder website, which is libcinder.org. Um, you can uh, download Cinder, and uh, there's also two five-chapter tutorials. The first five chapters covers everything up to that stippling algorithm I showed earlier. The second five chapters starts where the first five left off and turns that stippling algorithm into a 3D uh, flocking behavior. And it wasn't uh, too much of a stretch to, to get the flocking to, uh, to be more reminiscent of shoaling fish. And here we have, uh, I don't know, I think five to 10,000 fish and two predators that are constantly chasing the fish around. So there is sort of an unspoken fourth rule, and that's if you're about to get eaten, you should go somewhere else pretty quickly. But then I see videos like this, courtesy of the BBC, this, uh, this insanely beautiful behavior exhibited by these fish. I think these are anchovies. Um, you know, it's overwhelming. I, I haven't even come close to representing something like this. The behavior is just so lush, and it, you know, it runs at a nice 60 frames per second at least. <laughs> I was, um, so I don't know if you've heard this, this particular theory that, uh, that when fish do this, it's because they're trying, uh, like they're putting all their brain power together so that they can make like Voltron fish, this huge thing that, <laughs> that any predators would want to avoid because, oh my god, it's a really, really big fish. Uh, I think that thinking falls through because I think predator fish are smart enough to know that that's just more food to eat. Um, and also, based on the little bits of flocking experiments I've done, that behavior is very um, indicative of uh, cowardice. Every fish is trying to hide behind another fish. And if every fish does that, it ends up forming these really nice toruses and makes it easier for the predators to get a nice snack. But I'm no scientist, so I'll leave that to the scientists to figure out. But I think they're cowards, damn fish. <laughs> um, so the problem with these rule sets is uh, they're, they're invisible. All these forces I'm applying are invisible. Uh, and so I wanted to see what the forces looked like uh, in space. So I decided to, uh, to just flood the scene with a bunch of particles here. I'm using 10,000 particles and drop in different forces. Uh, there's uh, attractive forces, which are the glowing dots, and there's rotational forces, which are the voids. And, uh, and the particles are dropped into the space, and they will go where these forces tell them. And I sort of amped it up a bit and, and made it run with 150,000 particles, and you know, I, I, I just love the, the line quality that you get here. But secretly, what I'm, what I'm shooting for is something more like this which is a video provided by uh, NASA and the Solar Dynamics Observatory of the sun and its 19 plus particles. <laughs> so that, that number is the approximate number of hydrogen atoms in our sun. There's another way to think about it if you want numbers that may be a little more familiar. If you take the number of users on Facebook, multiply that by the number of photos uploaded to Flickr, times the number of tweets, some 30 billion, times the estimated size of the internet in bytes, um, circa 2005, times around four million. Uh, that's how many hydrogen atoms are in our sun. And the sun has become a source of great fascination for me. Um, thanks in, in no small part to people like Alan Friedman, who is taking these really impressive photographs of the surface of the sun using a three and a half inch telescope. I mean, that's, that's pretty fantastic. I didn't even think something like that would be possible. And Thierry Legault is constantly putting out these, uh, these just beautiful pieces of, of, of work where he takes photographs of the sun, but he waits until the International Space Station passes in front of it. Within one five thousandth of a second, he managed to capture the International Space Station transiting in front of the sun. I mean, there's, there's people in that. That's surreal. And here's a photo of some canyons. But that canyon is on Mars, and it was taken by a robot that we put there. And if you were looking at the right place at the right time, you would actually be able to see the track marks left by this robot. 
around this crater as it tries to look for a way to get down into the center of it. That's, that's impressive. We live at a pretty fantastic time that we can take pictures of tracks left by robots on other planets. And here's a, a photograph returned by the, the a messenger probe that just started to orbit around Mercury. And it's, it's sending back these really beautiful high-res photographs of the surface of this dead planet. But the, the most interesting image that it sent back was, was this picture where instead of looking at Mercury, it looked back towards Earth. And uh, you can see the Earth as the large star uh, with the moon orbiting around it, uh, sort of lost in this massive black void. Um, it's, it's very humbling, and I, I love this picture. So this fascination that I have with, with, uh, with the sun and outer space has tr definitely transitioned into the work that I've been doing uh, at Bloom. So the point of Bloom, uh, it's a little difficult to describe. Uh, the, the elevator pitch is that Bloom is attempting to find ways to combine uh, data visualization with uh, theories and concepts and aesthetics that you see more associated with video games. Um, I mean, people are putting a lot of time and creative energy into making these really lush video games where all you do is run around and shoot each other. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of enjoying that as much as I'm sure a lot of you, but uh, what happens if you take some of those same processes and apply it to a much more uh, stereotypically dry uh, visual paradigm like data visualization. Um, so I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to switch over to my iPad and show an app that we just released. Uh, it went uh, live in the App Store yesterday, and I think we're right on the verge of breaking into the top 10 uh, apps. Uh, hopefully we can break into the top 10 because then that'll trigger a bunch more downloads. Let's see if this will play along. Uh, so this is running on the, the iPad 2. So uh, the data that we decided to visualize was the data from the iPad's music library. Um, the, the issue that we were running into when, uh, when our uh, president, CEO, founder, uh, Ben Servini, was going from investor to investor, and he was trying to explain to them what Bloom was up to. And... Uh, uh, he was very often met with these looks of, I don't quite get it, so we'll wait and see what you do before we give you money. Um, we did end up securing a nice round of funding, which will last us a year, but uh, we, wanted, uh, we wanted a working prototype that we could share with the investors and share with uh, other potential collaborators so that they have an idea of what it, is, uh, when, what it is we mean when we say that we want to combine data biz with video games. So uh, every, every star you see orbiting here uh, represents um, an artist on my iPad library. I don't have a ton of music, but um, every single star is an artist, so I'm going to filter them by letter. And uh, the stars that you highlight are connected by uh, constellation lines. Let's go to Radiohead. I've been listening to a lot of Radiohead lately. So you tap on the artist star, you zoom in, and you see uh, a series of planets orbiting the artist star. Each planet represents an album by that artist. And it has this nice uh, throwable arc ball rotation. So it's a, it's a pretty intuitive interface for exploring this space. Um, let's choose their newest album. So once you've selected an album, uh, you see the moons orbiting uh, the uh, album planet. And the size of the moon uh, is based on the play count. So the more you've played a song, the larger the moon is going to be. And the, the song that you've played the most uh, will, will be a moon that has an atmosphere. The, uh, the orbital speed of these moons is equal to the track length. So once this moon makes it all the way around, that's the end of the track and it moves on to the next one. It is scrubbable as well. It's a little awkward, but it works. If, you, if you'd like, turn off the AI entirely, uh, the UI, sorry, to, uh, to have a more you know, spacey, immersive experience. Nice uh, real-time FIPS effects as well. Uh, 
Uh, but the, the bit that, that I'm uh, happiest with is the, the, the textures on these planets. Actually, let me turn this down a bit. The texture on the planets is based on the album art. So I don't know how familiar you, you are with this particular album's art. Let me find something a little more iconic. We'll stay in the world of, of Radiohead and choose uh, Tom York's album. So the album art for the eraser uh, is this black and white woodcut that has a red patch near the top. Yep. Time for the next track. <laughs> so it ends up being a pretty uh, novel way of exploring your music library. It, it tends, uh, I find that when I use it, uh, I end up playing music that I haven't listened to in a while just because I want to see what the planet texture looks like. Um, and uh, so this app is available. It's, uh, it's free for download, so there's no reason not to. Um, and it's our sort of first foray into this world. Next, we're going to be working on visualizing video data, probably from something like Vimeo's API or Netflix. And then we're going to try to tackle the, the monster that is social network data. That would be useful, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's called Planetary. Uh, and uh, hopefully it's broken into the top 10 uh, for free downloads. Thank you.